I called my next presentation Ethnoparasitology in West Africa because it is ethnologically based presentation on my work in West Africa a few years ago, uh, trying to establish a laboratory, a reference laboratory for um, parasitology in the state of Mali, which is a state that is currently witnessing a civil strife between the Islamic uh, uh, invading forces in the north and uh, the more docile and most wonderful and most beautiful people in the world in the south. The Mosque of Jene in the town of Jene is a World Heritage Center building. This is where Mali is. This is the Niger River. The strife which is taking place in Mali today is in this area here. Areas bordering on Algeria. A lot of weapons move from Libya to Algeria on the South Sahara and into Mali from here, spill over into Northern Mali from here. My mission, the first year I went there was to establish a first reference clinical parasitology facility in the country at the regional hospital in Timbuktu that is friendly to its ethnic and cultural tribal makeup. Number of tribes in Mali are the Bambara, which is the main tribe in Bamako, the capital city, the Touareg, the desert nomads, or the masked men that wear the blue veils, the men wear the veils and the women are not veiled. Dogon tribes, the most beautiful tribes in the world, they're cliff dwellers, they're like the Anisazis in our culture here. The Fulanis are the uh, uh, cattle herders. The Bozos and Songhai people are the fishermen. They're all centered around the Niger River. This is the Jene Mosque. You cannot do anything in Mali without passing through getting the blessings of the Minister of Health. <clears throat> This is the same vest that I was wearing here in this picture. <clears throat> my, my guide that took us places, our driver actually, a modern school in Bamako, the capital. You must have heard about the Boabab tree. This is the Boabab tree. They sometimes come as large as, uh, what, 10 meters, 15 meters wide in diameter. And, uh, <clears throat> The local people harvest the Bobab tree very cleverly. Uh, every single inch of the tissue of the tree is used as a medicinal or herbal or, <clears throat> or remedy use. Uh, so nothing goes to waste. And the trees are very tall and very high. This is a typical street scene in uh, Timbuktu. Timbuktu is a very old city. It was the seat of Islamic culture and civilization in the medieval centuries. All Islamic scientists went to Timbuktu to learn about the religion. It was not Cairo, it was not Mecca, it was Timbuktu. And after the heavy rains, a lot of the walls of these mosques, which are made of mud bricks, wither away and they are rebuilt and re-put together. Every two or three years, the mosques are practically rebuilt anew. Gingerbread mask and Sankara mask. This is a minaret and this gentleman is calling for the prayer. Congregation at the Gingerbread mask draws congregations Friday midday prayer. Uh, their Friday changes from week to week because their week in Mali is five days and not seven days. So every Friday follows a different week if you follow the Gregorian calendar. And then the marketplace follows the Friday player, so uh, the, the market shopping in the market and the open air markets uh, occur once every five days, which is the weekend. This is the Ahmed Baba Center for Documentation and Research. Text of the Holy Quran. The little children learn the Quran by writing on little tablets of wood or stone. This is a little school where children learn the Quran, the interpretation, and the teachings associated with it. The kids are also beautiful and smiley. 
typical street scene in Timbuktu. This is the mayor of Timbuktu, his associates, giving us gifts. Our last night we were there, we were in the roof of his house, and the time for our flight to take off. And, uh, but the airport could not interfere with the schedule of the mayor. So the mayor sent the guy to the airport, tell them, hold the plane until we finish dinner. So we arrived at the airport about three hours later. Everyone in the plane is all stuffed and stacked with people waiting until the mayor's party arrived to the airport. That was us. Typical dinner plate. You get the lamb or the sheep cooked on a fire, turned to you like you see in campfires and around it there are the vegetables and the rice and we all dig with our hands in as you can see. It's a very nice communal sense of togetherness, uh, share the same uh, plate. Those are Toregs who were dancing for us one evening. This is the, he plays a string instrument here, the women dancers. This woman had to have me come in the ring and dance with her, which I did shamelessly. <laughs> and. Uh, <clears throat> It was a lot, of, uh, a lot of excitement and entertainment. There's such a nice, generous people in the desert just treating us, a little picnic. Now, back to business a little bit. This is a fecal sewage system draining into the street from homes. There's no, this is the, at least there's a drainage system from inside the house to outside, and it moves with the gradient of the street. This is a more modern sewage system, more or less. The sewage runs outside the building here. And mind you, I should, I should tell you this. Uh, when I was lecturing at uh, Queen's College in, um, in England, uh, uh, the entrance to the Queen's College uh, had remnants of the same sewage system in England that was the empire that the sun never set up. And uh, they had the same sewage system at the height of the British Empire in England, in the Queen's, Queen's College. It rains six months a year and this drought six months a year. So during the uh, rainy season, the water collects in this makeshift uh, well there that is conically shaped. When the dry season, they bring water out by the buckets to the top where they can water small little plots of vegetables and so on. Those are in the areas which are far away from the Niger River. Mostly women going to the markets on the weekend to sell their produce and their products. Long trips sometimes, but all villages have their own open air markets. Uh, on the weekend, once every five days, remember. Woman selling lettuce and tomatoes. <laughs> Had to pay her a lot of money in local currency to allow me to take this picture. Very industrious lady. We have a good uh, prevalence of Antamoeba histolytica in Mali from our research there, and I imagine that's part of what's in this lettuce uh, dish in front of her. Women are extremely colorful in the marketplace. They wear all these beautiful gowns and this headwear. It's just a pleasure just to walk through the market and uh, be part of the festivities. There is some Echinococcus granulosis there, which is a disease transmitted uh, <coughs> through the uh, sheep and the dog and I don't know if I have another picture here or not but this guy was butchering uh, the sheep right there in the middle of the marketplace and people are piling it in small little parcels taking it home with them and the dogs were roaming around picking up the pieces of uh, meat that is not being sold the viscera so this is uh, an ideal uh, endemic spot for Echinococcus transmission This woman is pounding millet. Millet is the primary starch 
food uh, that they use for bread and so on and just smell it straight in some water, make a paste for breakfast. And as you can see, even the child, the baby, is on her back that does not stop her from working. And they're all very actively doing stuff in their society. The spice market, you can find everything else here. And in the spice market, you can get also salt. Salt there in, uh, in, in Mali is quarried in, uh, in, uh, from caves. It's like marble. And gold in Mali is so cheap. Salt is very expensive because that's what they use for the camel caravans to feed on salt and water going north into Morocco and back in their trade system. So if you want to buy gold, uh, cheap gold, if you have no problem getting cheap gold back into the United States, then trade it in with salt because in the market you will have the scale, <clears throat> as much salt as it weighs, you put gold on the other side of the scale, you can get your gold's worth of salt. Same weight. You can trade salt for gold. Same weight. So you can imagine what good business you can do. Artisans and artifacts throughout Bamako, the town. Men are also very nicely dressed, very colorfully dressed. On the market day, everyone is in their full regalia. Entrance to regional hospital in Timbuktu, which was built by the French in the late 60s. Walking through the hospital, that's where I had my lab there. This is what has been the nucleus of the parasitology reference lab that I established there. To the left is Dr. Fo, who was Russian, Moscow trained uh, uh, physician. And this is the lab staff, one microscope. And that's all there is at the time. We made a lot of changes. Staff meeting. This is a drugstore in the hospital. Most of the shelves were empty of drugs. It was a very poor condition and in need of many uh, uh, medications that were not there. A gift of uh, herbal remedies for them. We've done some double blind studies using the remedy on people that we know have had parasitic infections, see how it works. This is a typical hospital uh, ward room. Uh, this happened to be an empty room at the time. It usually has about four to six beds. And most of the patients here are either malaria patients or schistosomiasis patients, most of them. And the rooms are equipped to allow the families to live in the room with the patients that they brought in the hospital. A street scene in Timbuktu showing a kid that has malaria which was undiagnosed at the time, judging by the inflamed belly and the extruding belly button. The, the medical man, medicine man in, uh, in the area uh, had a temple of sorts and uh, sacrifices of chicken and millet and offerings were made opposite where he lived. This is millet that is more in a liquid form, and chickens are sacrificed here. And this is where the medicine man lived, the holy man. He's usually an elder person in the village or in the tribe uh, that has knowledge and wisdom and is trusted. And uh, once he is chosen by the elders, uh, he lives there, he leaves the family, and the children lives here by himself and the family and the wife brings the food to him every day, but he is, stays in that sanctuary on his own, but does not cohabitate with any other uh, uh, family or other members of the community. This is the meeting place, which is the most exciting part of the whole village life in, uh, in Mali. Uh, as you can see, it's built of eight columns. I don't know if you can count the columns. Eight columns, makeshift columns from stones, and it's made deliberately to be low, as you can see. You cannot walk into it, you have to bend, because during what you counterpart of city council meetings, 
you, the elder sits in here like this and then cross-legged and talk and discuss and make decisions and no one ever dares to stand up in anger and say something because this ceiling puts a limit. It forces you to be modest and be humble. You're always bending down or sitting down. You're never standing up, especially in anger. So it's, it's, it's a nice cultural flavor to how those people live. My group, this is the plane that was waiting for us, <clears throat> and everything is hand carried, as you can see. The, the pilots of the little propeller plane were Russian pilots. The Niger River, when it is not the flood season, goes down about 30 feet. <clears throat> we have a lot of parasites from the Niger River here that we extracted. Washer women are highly exposed to schistosomiasis because of their wading in the water in their business of washing clothes on the, on the bank of the Niger and then spread them on the bank to dry and then fold them and bring them back home. They're paid for this kind of job. And this is a ship that has a lot of dry fish, which is a very common stable in this part of the world. Fishing. At Bamako City Health Department, this is the, the health department laboratory. Here they test all uh, market products for infections before they are sold to the public. And we found out that 75% of food products roughly do not pass the test are contaminated because most of them are home produced and given to the lab for inspection and they're not allowed to go on the market. <clears throat> College of Public Health, which is sponsored by the World Health Organization, uh, they are specialized in research in malaria. This is the most highly skilled text that I've come across anywhere I went in the world, including Europe, because those kids can look at blood slides and identify malaria-infected blood cells. And if you know malaria like I know malaria, then you would know that there are two species of malaria, Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium ovale are almost identical, identical except for a very slight change in size inside the red blood cell and they can tell the two species apart just with the quickest uh, <clears throat> look with the eye. They can if you can separate those two species apart, you are really have made it. And those kids are very clever with that. This is the malaria laboratory. <clears throat> Going into the uh, village of Sangha, where the Dogon tribes live, the Dogons are the most, I think, the most civilized people in the world. Forget Western civilization. Uh, going to, Talg to, to Sangha, you will pass by those cliff, old cliff dwellings where the Telem ancestors of the Dogons used to live uh, centuries ago. This is the village of Sangha. one of the alleys and streets of Sangha. Typical house of Sangha, and this is the granary for storage of grains. There is a lot of similarities between the grains, uh, granaries or grain storage areas and ancient Egyptian primeval hills, the eight columns, in the meeting place, the eight rooms in the structure, and the eight ancestral gods are comparable to those ancestral gods that created the Egyptian civilization in Heliopolis and elsewhere. <clears throat> Shu, Tefnut, Jeb, Nut, Isis, Osiris, and Steth and Nephthys. And the alignment to the Giza pyramids is identical. 
making a house call, talking with prospective clients, <laughs> beautiful kids, school, in the Sangha village, workers going out in larger towns to work and come back again to the village in the evening at the end of the day, circumcision cave, it's an outdoors cave where children, boys and girls, circumcision is celebrated once every year. Those are all signs of tribes and families to honor the children, with which to, to assign them to their tribal sources. This is where the Dogons live. They are cliff dwellers, as I mentioned. Deceased are wrapped and processed, as you can see here, and they are pulled up and buried. Their burial places are in the cliffs uh, up above. And the Dogons celebrate nature and the creation. They have the counterpart of biblical Genesis, except that it is done symbolically, metaphorically, by their masks. You can see different animal masks, which are the animals in their, their, their uh, genesis form, and they with music and dancing rituals. You have to be there to uh, visualize the energy of the ceremony, the dancing with the music. And there, the snake is not evil. In their version of creation, the snake did not tell <coughs> Eve to tell Adam to eat from the apple tree. The snake there is perpetual. Actually, in all cultures in the world, except Christianity, the snake is a holy, beautiful creature. But it becomes associated with uh, a different negative version uh, in the Genesis uh, creation story. That's my favorite kid, which I really loved uh, reading from his own writing on the wooden tablet of the Quran that he was studying in the school. So thank you for being here.